Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, who have joined us uh, on this Dr. Fundi channel via multiple social media platforms, uh, via YouTube, via Facebook, via Instagram, and also via Twitter. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, we appreciate uh, you joining us at this point. Uh, it's a Saturday, uh, the first Saturday of um, September, which is the Heritage Month. Um, so, um, but today we are still continuing with the series that uh, we had started uh, at the beginning of August, where we were featuring uh, or were doing profile interviews with um, some of our, you know, uh, women of South Africa who are or who have done great things. Um, and so um, I still need another week to finish uh, the, you know, the number of people that I had planned to interview. So today we have an interesting interview in prospect uh, and our special guest today is Ms. Dudu Msomi, right? Uh, I'm sure most of you, especially those who are uh, in Facebook with me know her. We are Facebook buddies and we've been Facebook buddies for quite some time. Uh, but today, um, we are going to be talking to her. She's going to be sharing her wisdom with us about a lot of things that have to do with leadership, that have to do with strategy, that has to do with helping sick companies, you know, to get back to health, uh, and many things that are like that, you know. So um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about who Dudumsomi is. She is the founder and CEO of Busara Leadership Partners. All right, Busara, it's a, you know, a, a, a Swahili name. That means wisdom. So already the name of a company is about wisdom. It tells you that um, this is somebody who has a lot of wisdom. So she's the CEO of Busara Leadership Partners a research-orientated strategic advisory and consulting company whose expertise is to facilitate the development and effectiveness of leaders so that they can achieve their desired goals. Msomi labels herself an expert generalist, which affords her the ability to strike the right balance between depth and breadth of knowledge to be an effective strategist and facilitator for clients to see possibilities, to have courage and the knowledge to do the right things the first time, right? So it's the Japanese who've always, you know, uh, the quest for zero defect, you know, getting things right the first time around. So, you know, um, as she's assisting the clients, um, she wants, her clients, that is, you know, employer clients um, or other clients to get things right the first time around. She has a transdisciplinary, you know, um, qualifications and multi-sectorial experience, making her a sought after and powerful strategy facilitator, corporate governance expert, leadership coach, diversity and inclusion strategist. And that's something that is so much needed, you know, in this day, uh, the issues of diversity and inclusion are big, big issues, you know, in most organizations. She's a business advisor, keynote and guest speaker, and a writer. She designs and delivers bespoke leadership board and entrepreneur development programs. She was awarded the 2013 uh, Laureate Award by the University of Pretoria as a Gibbs alumni to honor her outstanding contribution to her chosen field and recognized by Entrepreneur Magazine as one of the top 29 influential South African business leaders in 2019. Dudu also presents a series called Wisdom, Wisdom Personified Conversations with Dudu Somi on YouTube channel Wisdom Personified. I was her guest. Um, I was the seventh uh, of the people that she profiles and that's about two years ago uh, in 2019. She also presents a series, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, she's contributed chapters 
uh, in some of the books, uh, like The Conversation in Leadership, South African Perspectives, edited by Terry Mayer, and also uh, Italia Boninelli, that was published in 2004. She also has contributed chapters in another book called Right to Speak, Right to Speak, um, a collection of stories written by African women leaders that was published this year, early this year. In terms of uh, professional qualifications, uh, she's got a BA honors from my alma mater, which is University of Natal, is now called UKZN in Devon. Uh, there are some friends already when they saw that we we're going to be talking to you today, and they said, Oh, we used to stay at John Bues together with her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of those is Dr. Nozukom Kabai. Oh, you know? my friend. God, yeah. we had good time. <laughs> yeah. She remembers you from John Bues. I, yeah. I remember that building. It was one of the uh, buildings uh, or residences that uh, had a lot of life at Howard College. And uh, for some reason, it used to have people who were very warm and uh, very sociable. So yeah. Um, all right. So she's got a postgraduate diploma in advertising and marketing from the AAA School of Advertising. She's got a postgraduate diploma in corporate governance from RAU, or what is now called University of Joburg. She's also got a certificate program uh, for management development from Gibbs, and she was not done with that. She went on to do her MBA with Gibbs. Uh, she's currently an Institute of Directors Fellow and is an independent, non-executive um, member of many boards, uh, one of those being the Reserve Bank. So maybe I might have to ask a few questions uh, about nationalization of the Reserve Bank. Uh, I know being a board member, uh, that could be a bit of a, ch a challenge for me to ask for her, you know, um, personal you know, views around that matter, which is something that uh, the governing party uh, is still pursuing. She is the chairperson of FSCA, OPFA, FAIS, OMBAT, HR committees, and sits on their respective REMCOMs, that is remuneration committees. She's also on the Vodacom Foundation Advisory Board and is also a trustee on the Humulani Trust of, you know, um, it's a listed company, um, it's a trust of a listed company in Victor Holdings. Lastly, she's a part-time commissioner of the KwaZulu-Natal Provincial Planning Commission. Sure, so many things that you are doing, Dudu. Um, welcome to the Dr. Pundi channel. Thank you so much for the invitation. All it's right. payback time, is it? <laughs> definitely, definitely. You know, two years ago, um, you were on the other side asking me a lot of questions, very difficult questions. Um, so now it's my turn uh, to do exactly the same uh, and ask you difficult questions. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure if there are any questions that you can't navigate, uh, you know. But anyway, um, welcome. Thank you for choosing to be with us this afternoon. You know, uh, Saturday afternoons are family, you know, or it's family time or private time. And so when somebody gives you their family time or private time, uh, it is important that, uh, you know, you recognize that, you know, it doesn't happen to everybody. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so what we're going to be doing is just to get people to know the person behind this business leader, this business strategist, this CEO of Busara, you know, leadership, uh, you know, um, uh, the organization. So please, um, we're going to take it easy at the beginning, just to ease you into this interview. And the first thing we're going to start with is, who is Dude? Oh my gosh, that's so complicated. <laughs> First of all, I mean, when you say who is Dudu, I think of my grandmother because I got this name at three. I shall not share with you what my names were before that. Uh, <laughs> so Dudu saw me is a name that I treasure. Uh, and my grandmother, Umam Loi, uh, when she lost her husband, uh, she found that I was her comforter. So yes. I really treasure this name. Um, 
in terms of, I must say, uh, talking about myself is not the, my favorite thing to do. I enjoy talking corporate governance and other things. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm my mother's daughter, I'm my father's daughter. Um, my father was uh, Vusmu Zim Somi. He passed away in 27, missed dearly. My mother is Mamsi Maureen Somi, and I hope she's watching us. Uh, she is uh, in, De in, in Durban. Um, and I had a sister, Ustelom Somi, who is missed and loved dearly, and she passed on. So I'm now the only child of my father and mother remaining. Yes. Wow. So um, are you the first born? I'm the last born. You're the last we were five. Person. We were five years apart. She was older than me. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So there were two girls in this family, um, and you were the last born. Now you know sometimes people, according to where they are in the family, you know, um, uh, you know, first born, middle born, or last borns, they tend to assume certain characteristics. Mm -hmm. You know, so as the last born, would you say you, the typical, you know, last born child, you grew up being that typical last born child, or actually um, you one of those last borns who actually go out of their way to make sure that they, they disprove, um, you know, all of these thoughts that people have about uh, last borns, the stereotypical, <laughs> you know, last born uh, kind of character. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I must say, when you asked me to do this, I went back, there's a letter, there's a, a speech that my mom wrote. Um, uh, we celebrated my life, my life in 2012. Um, we didn't call it a birthday. It was not anywhere near my birthday. Uh, she decided uh, that we must celebrate uh, the fact that she is joyous that I'm her daughter. So, and I was actually reading what she wrote. So if I can read it to you. Uh, yeah. She says, oh, she calls me my Duduza. Mm -hmm. yeah. So she says, I love my Duduza as I call her. In our family, she played, a, she played the role of being a mediator, although she was the last born. When things were not going well, she would intervene and call a meeting. Although I was not blessed to have a boy, Dudu masked that by fixing things around the house. She would fi fix things like the TV and so forth. When I asked her how she knew how to do these things, she will say, I read and learn, but you should try and experiment with stuff. You have nothing to lose. So that's what she said. She would sit and cross her legs and say, mom, I don't want you to feel that you have lost out for not having a boy. I'm here and I can do things for you. Wow, okay. That definitely is not a last born uh, kind of thing. If anything, you're more of a deputy parent yourself. <laughs> yes, I must say that part of me um, is quite strong. I, I've always just led myself. I suppose this is why even in the space that I'm in of leadership, uh, as much as I can teach on strategic leadership, courageous leadership, ethical leadership, I always go back to personal leadership. Uh, mm -hmm because the beginning, it's always about how you lead yourself. So as a child, I did not have to be told. Um, in fact, I was only hit once ever in my, no, twice ever. Um, and, and even then uh, it was well-deserved, uh, though sometimes I think not, um, but I always um, directed my own life Mm. and did not need other people to tell me how to behave. I just, I just knew how to behave. Um, and, and if I was out of order, so the first time I got a beating is um, I had taken a one cent, <laughs> one cent yeah. from the tiki box uh, where I knew my mom kept and I, I went and I bought a sweet. And when she came back, I told her that I took the one cent and she still beat me. Mm. So I asked her, I was like, so, but I, and I was like, probably five, six. Yeah. And I was like, but I told you I took it. She says, yeah, but it's still wrong. So you yes. need to understand that it's wrong. Mm. Uh, and the second time my father gave me a beating and then we still sat and spoke about it and we laughed about it. So um, I don't know, it was always just this, uh, 
way of being. Um, some people thought I was too serious. Um, yeah. I was literally a shy, a very shy child. Uh, I was even scared of my own relatives. This is, I'm a case study in evolution, in That's how, <laughs> how when, when you find what brings meaning to your life, mm. how it opens you up. Um, and uh, I literally was scared of my own relatives. I'll be hiding. Luckily, I was always a reader. So I started reading from a very young age. Um, I think I was three or four um, when I started reading. Um, my mother used to teach me before I went to school. And yeah. she used to, um, she put, you know, the children encyclopedias, uh, yeah. the Korean children encyclopedias. So I used, to, I used to read those. I don't know how. Um, yeah, so I, I literally used to just hide away from people. And, 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 um, and it was very, it, there's still that aspect of me that comes out. Um, mm. which is why I'm a hermit. If you mm. didn't see me on social media, you will not know. You don't meet me anywhere, do you? You, you will not no, meet uh, me. Anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> I, I so, meet you daily on, on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, so, and most people don't meet me anywhere because I'm actually a hermit, but I, I love knowledge. I love sharing. And so that interaction is, um, is part of, where I find meaning in the world. Mm, you know? Yeah, okay. Yeah, by the way, yes, I, I, I know, you, you post quite a number of, um, you know, pics uh, with your mom, uh, you know, and I, I've always thought, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, when I say that, I mean, yeah. she, 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 she's still so young, you know, uh, you, you, if somebody said to Sister Ruako, you know, uh, you know, she could pass as your sister, you know. Um, yeah, there was know. a time where guys will look at her more than me, actually. Uh, we'll be walking <laughs> down the road and I'll be like, uh -uh, which is fine, you know, but, you know, you know where you're good and where you're not, you know. So, I mean, yeah. she's a beauty. She's always been uh, yeah. and she's aging well. Um, yes. So, yeah. Uh, I will not take away that crown from her. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. So, but if we just look at um, that environment, Okulele Kuyo, um, that is the immediate family, the nuclear family, the extended family, and maybe this, the, the community of Okulele Kuyo, what would you say are the things that you learned besides now the love for reading that definitely you picked up early, uh, age three already, but just other values and principles that you picked up from the environment of Kule Guyo that are actually helping you as you navigate life today? I mean, the, the first one is just the diversity. So just starting in our family, we to call each other the fabulous four, the fab four. Yeah. So even though we were, we were such a small family, we were just so different. Our personalities are different. Um, but the common thing is the love we have for each other and the respect in terms of our differences. So mm. we never imposed. And people found that diff different, uh, difficult because they always wanted to see the competition or try yeah. and make it a competition. I was mm. more academic. My sister was more social. She was mm. very intelligent. It had nothing to do with her lack of intelligence. She was yeah. just... Uh, more extroverted and I was more introverted. My mm. father is also introverted. My mother is extroverted. So we kind mm. of have uh, 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 that. But so the diversity was something that was respected. On top of that, my family and the extended family, we are very diverse in terms of ethnicity, in terms of language. Um, so I grew up in a family where this whole et ethnic um discrimination that happens it's just foreign because yeah. it's like I'm hating myself for one I'm a mixture of Swazi I'm a mixture of Hubi I'm a mixture mm -hmm. of Sutu I'm a mixture of Khaled I'm a you know so and Zulu so if I'm gonna uh, kind of have issues it's kind of like <laughs> I'm saying it to myself so mm -hmm. it, and also my family um we the Somis but all the others their surnames uh, which I'll not repeat in case they yeah. outed. Um, yeah, so that for me was just a great grounding for 
the environment of having tolerance and truly enjoying being African. I think that's where we learned about we, we are proud Africans. Um, yes. We don't necessarily focus on I'm a Zulu, I'm a Swati, I'm a whatever. We are proud Africans. Uh, mm. And so th for me, that's important. But the other strong value for my family was uh, ethics. Um, yes. My yes. father was from a fairly well-off family, his, his yeah. background. But um, he, we had a conversation in 2000. We, we traveled around the country together for two weeks when I asked him, you know, just to understand his motivations in life. Um, and looking at where he came from, you expected him to have achieved much more. He said yeah. there was a bit of being a lazy. <laughs> he kind of yeah. said I was just lazy. But also he was just uncomfortable around um, being too uh, focused on materialism. Mm. My father was very much rooted in how you make people feel and how you carry yourself as an individual. And so much so that even in his last few years, uh, he, he will be, you know, talking to us and, and saying, you know, please help me thank you, mother, for the journey that mm. we've been down and any pain that I caused her to forgive mm. me, you know. And, and so I remember when we were young, um, I mean, we had a relative that was also quite wealthy and he used to have rental properties mm. and not really maintain them very well. And so whenever dad and I used to drive around, because on Saturday, our tradition was to wake up <laughs> Um, and go to the gravesides uh, and yeah. wash the tombstones and, 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 and do those things. So when we used to drive, um, they used to like flag down the car and talk to him about this relative because they knew that he was related. Mm. Um, and, and then when after the conversation, dad used to say, you know, it's not good not to treat people with dignity. There mm. is no amount of money that's worth not treating people well. And, mm. and so those little... Um, comments and, and ways of being that he's to, he's to exude in life really inspired me. Um, yeah, but just respect. I mean, I was just reminding my mother today. I was like, do you remember Evelyn? Evelyn was her patient. But my mom was a psychiatric, psychiatric nurse. And she also lectured as well. So Evelyn was one of her patients. So when um, was she used to be admitted, and discharged, admitted and discharged, and she used to be literally like a bag lady walking around the neighborhood with stuff in the trolley. And so Evelyn used to come home to our home. As a child, I used to, she used to be smelling, you know, baggage yeah. lady. Mm. Sit down, she used, to, we used to, uh, she used to go to our bathroom, not any other bathroom, watch in our bathroom. Yeah. I used to serve her. Um, and so we just never, we grew up not looking down at people. It's kind of yeah. like your station in life is not an indication of the value you are as a human being. And yeah. that part, um, I was just reminding mom of that. I mean, I remember one time she had a, a, a border for a, a short time because he was staying in a missionary. He was an albino. Yeah. He was staying in a missionary and he came and lived with us while he was doing his short course. And I, I just so am so grateful that she exposed me to a life where mm. things were just like, they were just normal, you know? Mm. Um, and, and, and I think that has carried me through in terms of just the way I approach even diversity and inclusion mm. when I, I, I work um, in that space. Uh, the, the compassion, the empathy, and understanding that even though we may seem to be occupying different stations in life. We are actually not different. We, we, it, there's nobody superior, inferior. We just have different abilities. Our circumstances are different. So I'm very grateful for that grounding. Yeah, yeah. So um, what would you say, you know, there's mom, there's dad. Who do you think contributed most in terms of, <laughs> you know, I, I'm gonna ask this question. Uh, I'm not saying, I mean, obviously both of them have, but who had the most influence in you? My father. Mm. Uh, because of our personalities, 
I mean, dad and I will literally walk down the street arm in arm. Yeah. And and we didn't have to talk. You mm. know, I mean, our communication was just, we could look at each other and we will know w- what it is that we're saying. Mm. So his, his calmness, his... Um, his uh, his strong ethics, obviously, and his love. His he had a love for family mm. that um, can never be reproduced in our generation. Yeah. Really, when I look at um, the the way he interacted, I mean, even when I was small, I mean, I used to be like a, a tail following him everywhere. Remember, this is the man. Uh, my mom gave birth to me while she was training and moved to hospital. Yeah. So she gave birth after her maternity. She left me with my father. That's the man that changed my nappies. That's yeah. the man that um, I remember one time I fell asleep. He could watch me, put me into bed and I would not wake up because that was my soft place, you know. Please. Um, and I remember the first time I gained weight uh, because mm. I was always a, a, a small um and I gained weight and he said something which was hurtful mm. and he looked at my face and I always say golly gumptious and he he never repeated it again. Um, mm. And I think I got that from him, just the ability to know how you're making another human being feel mm. and, to, and to not do it. Um, it. You know, there are times where we are just flippant with our words and we hurt people, words hurt. Mm. Um, and whatever it is. So I, I think what he gave me is the ability to be silent, the yes. ability to observe, the ability mm. to be empathetic, the yeah. ability to take responsibility. Yeah. Um, he, he was, his English was like <laughs> of another level. He did Latin, so just imagine. Yeah, so um, he's from the Royal Readers. Eh? Yeah, the origin of the word. Um, yes. And so he encouraged me. So in terms of my writing at school, um, and there were times when I um, got into trouble in terms of uh, how I use this brain of mine, and he will kind of encourage me and say, everything has a consequence. Uh, Mm -hmm. Even you may be unhappy about the result, um, but if you are proud that that was the right thing to do, uh, it, it's worth it. My mm. mom had an influence in a different way. My mom, as I say, is more extroverted. Mm. Um, so there were times where I sometimes used to feel like I'm adopted. If I didn't look like her, I would actually would have thought I was mm. adopted. Mm. Only because our characters were just so different. Uh, so she and my sister would be like chatting away. Mm. <laughs> and I would like look at these people and, you know, I, yeah. I don't even sit. Um, but she, um, her parents died when she was very young. Yes. She, I have a lot of what I have in my life because of that woman. Yes. yes. She, even though dad was more oh. from a, a family that was more um, um, materially accomplished. Yeah. She had the tenacity and the creativity to mm. make things happen. So if tomorrow there was not a cent in the house, she will find a way of making a cent. So, um, and gave me an amazing upbringing, really an amazing upbringing. I mean, when I look at my lifestyle as a child, I'm like, wow. You know, it's like, yeah, I I don't understand how she did it, but she was a portfolio life kind of person. You know, before it was fashionable, she was doing nursing. She had business on the side. She would um, uh, kind of import stuff from Swaziland, Lesotho, yeah. uh, sell, and and still do a lot of community work. Get women together. Try to mm. give them skills. Uh, be quite involved with Women for Peace. Uh, mm. So that that sense of giving back mm. is so key, so much so that I've integrated into my life and my business. So if I'm doing doing seminars, I will integrate school kids 
or invite people that can't, you know, afford it to be part of yeah. it. Mm. So you find creative ways of always giving back without having to say, oh, now I'm doing CSI, you know? Yeah. <laughs> mm. All right. So, so, so basically, there's a lot you took from your dad. All right. But there's also a lot that you took from your mom, you know? And I still do. I mean, yes, she's still, yes. you know, um, so even though we're different, you can always learn from somebody who's different. Um, yeah. And uh, she's sometimes uncomfortable with the way I, um, even though I was a quiet child, I was always a forthright child. Um, yeah. I think that's why I was good at mediation. Uh, yeah. So, you know, something will happen. My sister, of course, most of the time, I mean, I, we, I was in boarding school since I was eight and I turned nine yeah. in boarding school. She yeah. also was. But she spent a lot of time at home. So she will yeah. call and say, okay, they've just done this to me. Um, can you help? <laughs> then yeah. I will get everybody over the phone and it will, we'll chat about it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, those, those skill sets um, yeah. are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But Oksalayo, Ungundo Bigaisi. You know, uh, <laughs> you, you I'm know, my father's daughter. Hey, you um, walk the streets, uh, you know, Niba Bene Noba, but Gigantology. You know, and he used to come and he used to sit on my bed. So he'll, he will come in the morning and he'll sit at the edge of my bed and um, and and we'll chat. Or if if he found me ultra quiet because yeah. um, I'm not a good nagger. Which yeah. is, I suppose that's why I'm still single. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't do it. I'll, I'll say once or twice, I don't like this. If it continues, I'm out. Um, <laughs> so he's to, he's to um, come to me and say, uh, I can feel there's something. Did I do anything wrong? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that you should just melt me. I mean, yeah. that man. Uh, and, and, and we could talk about it. Um, and yeah, he was just also, his, my mom used to say, you know what, you forget that your relationship with your father is not the same as a man with his wife, because he used to yeah. cook for me. <laughs> he used to cook for me. I remember one year I was a day girl, because I've been at boarding school all my life. Yeah. So one year I had um, uh, like health issues. So my mom had to bring me just to get for me to be examined. So at, I used to come to, I used to be going, I used to take the bus and, 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 and the bus used to take us back home. Um, and my father used to set up my lunch. Mm. He used to come from work, set up my lunch. When I come back at two, three, my lunch is at the table. Sure. You see now, uh, when I look and, and listen to everything that you are saying, uh, I'm thinking, sure, he set such a high bar for anybody would come and, uh, and, and and tell you sweet nothings, you know, or somebody who but, wants but, yeah. a lifetime with you. I mean, because you had that person there who was doing things that most men do not do. And, and, and that's the benchmark. <laughs> yeah. And people, this is why I always say this whole thing of stereotyping people, like this yeah. is a Zulu man, this is a whatever, Mm. The individual, that's what he made me appreciate, mm. um, that every individual is different. He cared enough. Um, there's the to Tony uh, Morrison thing where, um, about if your child walks in the room, do your eyes light up? Yeah. Whenever I heard that, I thought of my father because they literally like lit up. I knew I was making his life better uh, just mm. by my presence. Um, mm. But, um, and I remember the first time he met the first guy I dated, uh, he collected me at Varsity. And, um, and I shall not share his name because he's well known. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I love, I, I always like to be very open about communication. So I should yeah. say, if you come to my dorm and I'm not there, I will leave a note. So if you're not there, leave a note. Yeah. And on this day, he knew I was going to be picked up and he didn't leave a note. I went to his dorm. So I left a note to say, okay, dad has come and we're gone. Because I had told him we were waiting for dad uh, around this window. And, uh, and so just as we were driving out of campus, he ran um, and, and then dad stopped. 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, Dad said, uh, and he and he had such a, a dry sense of humor. We're very much the same. You, you, unless you know our personalities, you will yes. you will not take kindly yeah. sometimes. So Dad said, you know, there's only one thing you need to do to keep my daughter happy is just to be a good communicator. And mm. this is the first thing he says to the guy he's never mm. met before. And so this guy looks and and then dad just cracked a smile. And then I, I, he went into the car and then I said my goodbyes. But yeah. that that is the first man I told when a guy was interested. I, I, I didn't tell mom, I told him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, uh, and your mom being a psychiatric nurse, uh, obviously she did a lot of psychology. And uh, there's something about, um, I think it's, I think it's Freud who came with different stages of human development, you know, um, you know, oral stage, anal stage, uh, phallic stage, and then yeah, there's yeah. the part around between five and seven years old where a child gets to be very close to the parent of the opposite sex, um, you, you know, uh, or gender, um, and uh, that is a phase that a child needs to negotiate, uh, you know, and at that point they are competing with, uh, you know, the parent, that is, in your case, your mother, yeah. for yeah. the attention of dad. And, uh, you know, it's, it can also be quite a, a problem at times because that competition can be so strong. Uh, but it sounds like, um, you know, um, you negotiated that, you know, that, 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 that stage, but still continue to be very, very close with dad. And I hope uh, you were not competing too much with mom you, as you got older. Oh, no, she always, ha she always had her space. You know, I mean, uh, their love story is another one because they yeah. met long before they knew they were going to meet. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so they they had their their thing. Um, Mom and I have a love relationship. Also, mm -hmm. that is just so. Um, most people get confused. Who is your favorite? Because yeah. I do have different relationships. We but because them. people who knew my dad before, uh, I mean, somebody was just telling me that too. Mama was saying it. Uh, she was sometimes. Um, used to watch my dad and I and kind of feel, oh my God, my daughter, I don't have my daughter. She is just, you know, so much in her father's corner. But yes. my mother and I are also like twins. I mean, she's, mm. she's fascinating. I mean, mm. sometimes you'll find her staring at me and I'm like, why are you looking at me? She's like, I just like, you are so me. <laughs> like, I don't think so. I, I mean, I'm darker for one. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so... I I've been very fortunate. Um, yeah. Even though my sister and I were five years apart, we actually started clicking more when I was older. You know, when you're younger, yes. I mean, it's very difficult. Uh, when you're older, then we, she always used to like um, be very proud of me. And uh, so whenever, whether it's her boyfriends or friends, oh, Dudu, you have to come and see Dudu or Dudu yeah. come and meet whoever. And for a child, a shy child, that's the worst thing you can do. Mm. It's like, you know, I now we have to meet these people. Um, but she was always proud of me. Um, mm. And we always um, had this relationship where even if we were not always together, mm. if we had a conversation, it was real. Um, yeah. I mean, three days before she died, um, she called me. Usually I switch off my phone when I sleep, even now. Yeah. But this night I didn't. And at three o'clock, uh, she called and I answered, 3 a.m. And, and she said um, goodbye. And I mean, she wasn't that ill for me to think, yeah. I mean, goodbye for, she was in hospital, but not that ill. Um, she was just going through observations and for her to take medication that she was resisting. And so I said, can you wait for me until Saturday? Mm. Um, and she says, okay, and didn't ask, I mean, there are some things, some connections you have in life where you just don't, you just know when somebody calls, but I, I would not have said, you know, she's definitely going to die. I didn't know that was the case. Mm. And, um, and that was Wednesday in the morning, my mom called and kind of said, she's uh, feeling down. You always 
uh, you know, make her feel better. So, yeah. uh, you know, call, you know, do you, do you wanna come? And I left with the last flight to, to Durban. Uh, so I was there earlier than Saturday, but I had told her I'd be there at two because I sent her a message, she will be there too. But we went to pick her up earlier in the hospital. And so by the time we got home, um, I mean, the whole journey to her last hours on this earth was just like magical for me. Um, mm. And because um, I remember we stopped at a Woolies because I wanted to buy her raspberries because I used to feed her raspberries while I'm massaging her feet. So I bought those and other things and I was taking long seemingly. So she asked mom to, <laughs> to call me back into the car because uh, she said she wants to go home and we thought she just wants to go home and we couldn't understand why she's in a hurry mm. and at some point we had stopped at a clinic because I don't know what mom wanted to pick up for her and she wanted water um, mm. so I went and bought her bottled water so by the time we started driving uh, towards our home she started like jumping up and down and saying mm. I'm going home I mean it was like a glow mm. and we were like you know, we were appreciating that, but we're thinking, oh my gosh, I've never seen anybody so happy to come home. Mm. And we got home, we parked. As we parked, she started losing strength. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it was like, what? And she said she wanted water. And I remember dad came out of the house and, and tried to go back to go and get her a glass of water. And I yeah. said, no, 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 no. She has to drink the water I bought for her. I have no idea why I wanted that to be the case. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then she asked what, what the time is. And we looked at the time, it was 20 to 2. And uh, she was losing strength. And we took her, in, we started carrying her to her bedroom. And as we got to her bedroom, just before she got onto the bed, she was in my arms and she just died. Mm. Exactly at two o'clock in my arms. Wow. Um, but when you look at just that journey, part of why it's so mad, it's just like everything, mm. it, it just doesn't, it's like the connection. This is where you understand how spirits, yes. that we are ultimately spirits. And mm. Um, mm. so mm. it wasn't, it wasn't, it was painful. But mm. at the same time, it was like, you know, the best experience for me being mm. there with my sister as she draws her last breath. And the mm. fact that we have nothing unsaid, nothing mm. to regret, uh, mm. and, and, and that everything we wanted in terms of our relationship had been accomplished. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Um, you know, I think uh, the area of spirituality is an area that still needs to be, uh, you know, uh, I would say researched a lot because we know very little about that space, yet things happen. And yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, it can't be a coincidence. There's more that we don't know around, uh, for example, you know, those last few, you know, uh, minutes of your sister as you guys were yeah. going home. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, um, you know, again, the good thing is that if you are a spiritual person, then you know that the person has transitioned, you know, but is still there. You oh, know? she'll always be there. She's, uh, I mean, she's everywhere. My pic her pictures, but I mean, uh, she did say her journey. She's not gonna get kids. She's not gonna get married. Uh, yeah. Her journey's done. Um, yeah. And this is where you understand that when you are so aligned to what your soul is. Yeah. is I here to do she said yeah. my journey is done um yeah. and um I mean the same thing I mean I was with my dad when he passed and he couldn't speak and I knew he was holding on for me he used yeah. to always say the only thing I want in this life is to walk it down the aisle mm. <laughs> so, he's still well, waiting so <laughs> and, he waited and waited and uh, you yeah. never knew that <laughs> yeah no but I mean before you went to the hospital I kind of said um I don't know. I have this, I don't know. My personality is, I have these conversations. And I, so before he left and I said, I know um, it's a small procedure, but just in case you don't make it. Yeah. Um, or how are we going to communicate when you're on the other side? So he like looked at me, what do you mean? I'm like, dad, we need to have 
away so that I know you're not communicating with me. Yeah. Um, and I remember I was recording this and uh, when I lost that phone, it affected me for a while. I just like lost it because all my mess, my last conversation with him was on that phone. Mm. Uh, but he said, no, I'm not ready. I'm, I'm not ready yet. Um, and I remember when I came to the hospital uh, room the next day and he couldn't speak um, and I could see he was in pain. So I just whispered as like, I, I know you want me to let you go. Uh, I know you're just waiting for me. I, I, I know you made that promise um, mm. that you're not ready, but it's okay. I'll be fine. Mm. And literally the next morning, he, 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 you know. So, but this is the thing I always say to people. Um, I, I don't know if we choose uh, which family to be born into. Mm -hmm. uh, in my belief system, I do. Um, mm. My mother lost two children, lost two boys before my sister was born. Stelo yeah. is called Stelo because she was a gift. Yeah. Um, and I came five, Stelo was two months premature. Yeah. I came, I was full birth. I always tell her, good tea. Um, you know, I, I, I'm full birth. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but, uh, and she also wanted us so much, you know, to fulfill mm. something. And yeah. so I always tell her, Guti, I know I answered your prayers yeah. and, I, and, and, and came, came into the family that I came into with all the arrangements, extended families, yeah. whatever. And mm. whatever lessons I'm here to learn, I, I, I don't know what they are. Mm. Um, I think when you're born, you forget, um, you know, but uh, you experience whatever. So I take it so seriously, the people I interact with, the souls that I connect to. And mm. I do, I mean, there are people you meet in this world and you just, you like, you know, you feel complete. Yes. You know, they don't have to be a hubby or, mm. or whatever. You just like, there's something in your spirit that just, I, I really enjoyed those kinds of, I mean, like Nozugo, we were yes. in Johnson's yeah. together. Um, yeah. And we had a friend called Nesta. Who also sought me out, uh, Nesta? Yeah. I, um, you possibly, I mean, I remember walking from a um, varsity because uh, first term, because uh, uh, another story of I was late applying because I changed my mind seven days before going to UCT that I wanted to go to Natal, yeah. so I was late, so all the uh, places were full, and so I was walking from campus to Anchor House because there was yeah. an off-campus. Uh, accommodation at that time I only moved into John Views after Easter yeah and this woman crossed the road <laughs> and came to me and she says I've been watching you I always watch you and I really like your spirit I like you and I mm. like to be a friend and that was Nesta that was our friend so she mm. was very close to Nozuga that's how we yes. all became you know yes. friends, so friends I, yeah. I truly believe in just the connections you have um, mm. in this world and don't take it seriously which is why I always say the whole thing of having grudges you're not talking yeah. to this one I mean honestly you know I'm not talking to my parent I'm not talking to they did this to me it's that you know that scar is such a small scar in the context of things yeah. I mean when I can speak about death and be glowing because yeah. you you have no regrets yes. um because I think our hell is in our mind because mm. the memories, when you play back and say, oh, I regret this, I regret mm. this. Um, so yeah. I, I, I enjoy that journey as a human mm. being. But it's amazing though, uh, you're talking about Tuno Zuko, um, you know, um, Magafrika Medical School, you know, 1989, I was doing final year and uh, she was this bubbly, energetic young lady um, and uh, she's been my friend ever since. But one thing I've learned about her in recent times is that she's quite spiritual. So yeah. as you were talking about the souls and stuff, you know, and the lady who crossed the road, and I'm thinking, ah, all right, okay. Somebody was already connecting these yeah. spiritual, you know, <laughs> spiritual there's people. Always, the universe is always, I always say in life, there's never a vacuum. The universe, first of all, the universe never leaves a vacuum. Yes. So even though I don't have my sister around, I mean, the sisters that are around me, like siblings that are not from my uh, parents, 
I mean, yeah. I have uh, Donnie Walker, who's like uh, like a son that yeah. <laughs> my parents never had. Yeah. Or Tutu, Abobuyani. I mean, yeah. I, I just have that. But also the fact that the universe always conspires. When, you're, when your intentions are good as a, yeah. as a human being, uh, yeah. the universe conspires to help you. So, mm. uh, which is why, you know, we get sometimes desperate in terms mm. of financial needs, uh, which yeah. is why we get into trouble and we get into corrupt relationships and corrupt practices. But uh, if your intentions, and, and you have to prepare yourself. I mean, yeah. part of the leadership space, I always say uh, a good leader, it's about personal integrity and technical mm. competence. So yeah. you still can't take a shortcut. But when yes. all those things are aligned, the universe does help um, you know, to, to, to bring things to you. So my business will not be my business without the referrals because yes. my friends and people I know in social media, wherever, are guardian angels. Yes. Um, so, but they read your energy and they read your intentions yes. and the universe. So all mm. these things are interconnected. Yeah. All right. Let's move on now. Um, just one question from the young days. What did you want to be at that point as a young person, um, you know, before you go to high school? I evolved. My mom always reminds me how I wanted to be an astronaut. I was a Star Trek girl. So, you know, that universe and uh, yeah. living uh, even now, I mean, whenever there are new versions of Star Trek, you'll find me there. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to be an astronaut. And then at some point um, when in high school, I did art. So I used to love yeah. Frank Lloyd Wright's work and architecture. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I'll be an architect. Mm. Um, and then uh, after, uh, my mom actually is the one that pushed me towards psychology um, and uh, and I did it to third year. <laughs> yes. So you and, had psych uh, three. It was because yeah, yeah. Psych and three. then I had to think about what I'm going to focus on going forward. And I must say, at some point, I thought my lecturers were crazier <laughs> than the rest of us. And I thought, mm, I don't know if I want to go there. Um, yeah. And and. And uh, this, I had this friend who was also in John Buse, who's an Ellen Bogaz. Yes. And uh, for her honors, uh, she was doing cultural and media studies. Yeah. And, um, and she kind of said, I'm going to be doing that. Uh, don't you want to do it with me? <laughs> and uh, train from psych into yeah. media studies. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, but psychology is in everything. Human behavior, yeah. understanding the human mind is in everything. Yes. Yes, um, yes. And, um, and then I was introduced into the world of advertising. Yeah, all right. But let's just get to the last part uh, in my trick. Did you know what you wanted to do at that point? And how did you get to be in Natal, which was the 11th hour thing, because you wanted to go to UCT? Yeah. Uh, no, no, actually, UCT, I wanted to go to UCT after the first year at Ongoye. And in Ongoye, oh. um, there were so many strikes. Okay, I have to go back. So after my trick, I wanted to go to Kingwood's College and do post matric. Yeah. Because uh, I think it was grade 11 or grade 12 where we went to the Grahamstown Film Festival or yeah. the Arts Festival. Arts Festival. Think, yeah, yeah, the school one. And I, I love the environment in Rhodes. And at some point I had thought I'll uh, maybe a journalist or a lawyer. It was between those two. And so when we were there, uh, I thought mm, it may be worthwhile coming to Rhodes. And, but I also... I wanted to go to Kingwood's College because I had heard that they have a lot of extra activities, horse riding, canoeing, you know, those kinds of things. So I wanted yeah. to experience that as post matric because yeah. then you were attending some of the lectures, I think, at Rhodes. Yeah. I applied for that. My response didn't come. Yeah. So then we were stuck. Now she has no other plan because the other plan was to go to tech. I love photography. I've always loved photography. My first camera, I think I was, I don't know, 10, 11. Uh, you know, those uh, instant ones, the ones that yes, had to- Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. I see them, yeah. So I wanted photography. Uma, my, my mother tore up my application because no child of hers was going to technical. And then I, I had- think, a I think Uma, um, you're, um, you're, uh, um, uh, I think- Uma, uh, yeah, so, and then, and, and I had also applied to 
uh, British, you know, British Commonwealth, British Council oh. scholarship to go to the UK because Dad had done two or two years in University of Manchester, and he always wanted me to go and study there. Umama yeah. had gone to University of Sheffield um, yeah. to do a uh, community-based something. Uh, my mom is also one who's like studies and studies and studies. So um, those were also torn up because. Um, <laughs> We had a relative who, um, who used to be studying in the U.S. and uh, who's closer to my mom's age. So his experiences made mom very scared that yeah. I may turn out also, otherwise. So she mm. didn't want me to go. So yeah. literally, I had Kingwood's College and I wanted to go to Rhodes. So the response didn't come. And um, Umama knew uh, there was a friend of hers who was a lecturer uh, on Goya. So they quickly had to put in an application. In fact, I came like February, like yes. um, by that time, you know, you usually come beginning with the inductions and yeah. whatever. So well, I was literally it. late and there was no space in Zani. In Zani. So I literally had to stay in the boys area because there, there was a block that was um, allocated, but to mature women. <laughs> so Usus uh, Nomangwe, who was a family friend, uh, I agreed that I stay with her. Um, yeah, so, but Ongoye, the first year, I mean, for me, it was the most amazing experience, having been a minority all my life, yeah, um, yeah. going to, you know, these schools, uh, and suddenly you just amongst the sea of other Africans. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I loved it. But to mama couldn't take the stress. Mama strikes, good to see Alandwa, say Bahisha, and mm. <laughs> and she was like, um, so they tried to get me to go to University of Chicago because my a family friend was a, a lecturer there. So he was going to get me there. I was like, no, nah, I'm not going. Um, so the only compromise was that I got to UCT. So oh, UCT accepted me, but uh, I changed my mind and mm. uh, and then got to Natal. Luckily, my marks were good enough. Uh, yeah. So I was allowed to then go to Natal. All right. Okay, so you went into Natal and uh, you did your BA and then an honors uh, degree as well. And that's where you did your psychology one, two, three. Um, and uh, yeah, so when you came out of that, um, did you then say, okay, you know, no, because then yeah. because I see then that you, you went to triple A uh, School of yeah. Advertising, uh, you know, for advertising and marketing. Uh, and how did that interest come about? Um, yeah. And then from there, uh, you went and did the program um, at, uh, you know, uh, University of Pretoria and ended up with an MBA. So I'm trying to, 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 to get a sense of how did you, you know, get to advertising and marketing without more business things? Uh, and then... Yeah. Wapela's whole business was that's where you are now. Yeah, I mean, I always believe that you kind of have to be open to the universe. Yeah, mm. so I, I'm not so stuck about uh, a, a title. Yes. To, you know, I must be that. It's all more about the experience. So psychology, I discovered that I like the human mind and understanding yeah. human behavior. Uh, so when I was doing my honors, I was passing one of the halls. And I saw women, and there was a, a woman from AAA School of Advertising, I think the CEO or executive director, who was talking about advertising as a career. And I sat in and I listened, and I thought, hmm, interesting, you know. And part of the media studies, you kind of look at, you know, all types of disciplines, yeah. uh, journalism, um, broadcast media, and communications in general. Um, and um, yeah, so. I, my thesis for my honors was around CCTV, um, yeah. which was, um, and I got an interview with Uma Dala Mpachela, who was the head of CCTV at that time. I yeah. remember my lecturers just couldn't believe it. They're like, we've been trying to get hold of that man. And yeah. you, the one that got the interview, so I had to go to Jobokton. So I was very much in, interested in media, broadcast media particularly. Yeah, And so I, after my honours, I then thought I would take a break because I'd been at school since I was four, five. Yeah. And 
Um, my lecturers in the honors were very excited. I mean, Ruth and Kane Tomaselli are the ones that ran cultural and media yeah. studies. Um, yeah. And they wanted me to do my master's. And I'm like thinking I'm 21 doing my master's. I'm not quite sure that I want to be in, a, in academia full time. Mm. Yeah. So I needed just a year off just to think about it. And yeah. I had thought I would go and au pair in New York. Yeah. To, to see if I can survive looking after small kids in a foreign yeah. country. <laughs> yeah. But the lady who was organizing that, she had a heart attack. So um, she couldn't. So um, it come May, some of my friends were getting very bored with me. Um, when they call me, I'm still in bed reading and enjoying myself. And they were like, no, this is not fair. You have to be doing something. So yes. one of them actually, Ubongan Pagati, organized yes. a meeting with the recruitment firm. Um, yeah. and, uh, and then I was recruited into, um, at that time, Edcon was looking for retail management trainees as part of yeah. their leadership pipeline development. And, but then you had to start from a store. Mm. Uh, so in my respect, it does. Like you mm. work your way up. Um, but uh, during that time, I applied to AAA because uh, postgraduate. So yes. I knew to come January, I'll be going to AAA. Yeah. And within that, I, I then was, I thought I will specialize in media management or yeah. something because I've always written since I was a child writing. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think I needed to do copywriting because I yeah. had a skill, yeah. but I thought media management so that I can get into media. Yeah. But when I understood the different choices I then wanted to do specialization in direct marketing mm. because um, I don't know, in marketing at that time, the Bible was fake popcorn. He used to talk about the trends of the future yeah. and going in the future, one-on-one -on -one communication and how do you reach people one-on-one -on -one was the mm. way. So direct marketing at that time was the one way I could start learning those principles. Yeah. Um, so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and we were actually sponsored by SABC to do. Mm. So it was the first time in my life I actually had somebody paying for my uh, education without my parents being the ones. Um, yeah. yeah. So a lot of us who are Africans, uh, SABC was flying back. But when we finished, uh, because Quinton Green was the one who was CEO at that time, yeah. when we finished, then... Um, uh, they froze the position. So there were no hi yeah. new hires. Mm. Um, so that's how I then got to be um, uh, going to interviews with advertising agencies. Mm. So that's how my life then. So mm. I went to a number of them and one of them was Sachi and Sachi. And yes. I was interviewed by this man called William Leach. Mm. And he was wearing jeans and a white top. And I think there must have been maybe a hole somewhere. And I was like, huh? Is this, and this is the leader of an organization. Mm. And I mean, our interview was supposed to be one hour. It ended up being two hours. Sure. Um, and they were looking for an account executive to work on the Pepsi account. Yeah. And, and at that time, uh, the- and This, uh, this of, must be around uh, mid nineties. Um, yeah. Was yeah, 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 1995. And at that time, the concept was very American accent. And I was very like, I was like, okay, this is the new South Africa. Uh, we may like African Americans and have some ident yeah. identify with them, but we actually, this is an opportunity for, uh, for this brand to capitalize on the euphoria of a new South Africa. Yeah. Uh, make us feel proud. Our pay, pay, pay offline was the choice of the new generation. I was like, there was so yeah. much you could do. And mm. he was just like, okay, so you have so many ideas about this. Do you want to join? So that's how I joined Sachi and Sachi. Um, mm. and, and it, I um, mean, it was a, it was a top uh, ad agency then. And I think it still is a, a top. But now, uh, uh, haven't they changed the name? Is it still Sachi and Sachi now? Yeah, it should be. I don't know. No, there was another one. There's another one. Um, oh. The brothers left the other one. And yeah. Oh, so, so, okay. Uh, but right. there are two of them. So yeah, globally, I mean, I remember one time because um, uh, William Leach was one of those guardian angels in my life. And I was selected to be a graduate trainee in, in um, 
such and such in London. And I was the only African one um, uh, sent. Uh, so a whole lot of us from different countries uh, for six weeks to learn to do things the such way. And, um, yes. and uh, so he sent me there. And I remember, I mean, gee, I mean, you're in London, you have to go clubbing. <laughs> So, I, and I did this club tour where you do like six clubs a night. Mm. And, and this, uh, is, this is the introvert who grew up in Durban. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there she is now in London, uh, in that small <laughs> island, uh, you know, called England. And then the next minute you are doing, uh, you know, a tour club of clubs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and I was going with my cousin. Yeah, they live in England and... Uh, and I remember being in this club and this guy came and danced with me and he and he says, so what are you doing? As I say, I'm working for such and such. I mean, the guy was like, oh my gosh, that's how the brand was at that time. People mm. just like, I mean, these two win awards. It was just one of the top agencies. Um, mm. So yeah, it was a privilege. Uh, I know if I had been in another agency, my life mm. would not have turned out the same way. Because yeah. I also got a father in Mr. Tsomudise, who, yes. um, I mean, it's it's the privilege of not being um, repressed in, and suppressed as a human being, being yeah. allowed to be who you are, even yeah. as a young person, mm -hmm. where it's kind of like, I mean, I remember one time William uh, Leach organizing, there was... Um, I don't know if we had all done some personality tests or something, you know, the personality tests that you yeah. do. Uh, but for some reason, uh, this her name was Helena. She had extra engagements with me to just find out my interests more, you know, mm. and, and I think she did a report in terms of my motivators and drivers mm. and uh, because he really wanted to know how to reach me and how to make me a satisfied employee. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, to have that as your first boss, it mm. spoils you for anybody else. I mean, exactly. this, this man, I mean, my mom, because I used to be so busy, um, she used to literally come into the office with me sometimes when she was visiting and yeah. he will serve her coffee and whatever. But I remember because sometimes I used to be walking around the passage, maybe I have my tackies and my shoelaces are untied, yeah. to kneel down and tie my shoelaces. Yeah. I mean, a person it's, it's, who it's not so one, not, not something that one has, you know, can behave like that. He was an yeah. atypical boss in many ways. You know, when you are so comfortable in your skin that yeah. his abilities have nothing to do with how the position is just by the by. And yeah. he was comfortable. So, and that was also one of my amazing teachers and his lessons have, have also been part of how I've developed myself within Pusara uh, Leadership Partners in terms of how a leader should yes. be. Uh, yes. And why I always focus on personal leadership because yes. the relationship with you have with yourself and how you feel about yourself and the relationship we have with others, it all starts with you. Uh, exactly. And he was so comfortable in his skin. And also Mr. Mujise, he was um, closer to my mom's age. So he was like my father. Literally, there were times if I didn't want to do something, he would call my mom. I was like, you do know I'm a professional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's just not on. Yeah. <laughs> but he brought me around the table. Who brings a 23, 24-year-old around the table to help craft a business case about how do we, you know, sell to a black shareholding long before BE. Uh, yeah. About. Um, and, and, and so he literally used to bounce things off me. Um, and it, it was just a, a, a lesson that you can't get it from any MBA. So by the time I went to the MBA, it was really just to get the certificate because mm. um, it's very difficult to be young and have the knowledge you have and people not taking you seriously because it's like, where do you get it from? Yeah. And to try and explain that since the first day I walked into this agency, yeah, the way I've 
interacted and, and the opportunities that I was allowed to be part of gave mm. me a perspective and um, a, a business school environment that mm. was unmatched. So the mm. information that I have and the knowledge I have, and on top of that, I didn't take shortcuts. I will still learn, you know. Um, so things like corporate governance. I remember yes. talking to a friend of mine, um, uh, Umpo Magwana. Yeah. And we were, I mean, this is like first year of work. And we were talking about what is the pinnacle of corporate? What, yeah. what when you say you've arrived, what does it look like? And, we, and uh, I remember him saying, it's, you know, you sit on boards. Yeah. That's my first year of work. I have no idea what that is. Yeah. And I said, oh, so how do I prepare for it? <laughs> so he mentioned corporate governance. I was like, okay, I'm going to research this. And, yeah. and I did. And that's how I got to Rao. And mm. our lecturers were literally the commissioners that wrote King One and King Two. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah, yeah. Michael Katz. So that time it was King Two. Was it King yeah, Two already yeah. that time? It was just evolving into King Two. Yeah. So they were the lecturers, you know. Um, and uh, so those conversations are also uh, very important. Um, yeah. But Mr. Modise and William Beach, I always say, um, they are my guardian angels and they definitely spoiled me. It made it difficult. I couldn't go to another agency. And the only reason I left is because I wanted, I always knew I needed to accumulate different skill sets for what I wanted to do later yes. on. Yes. And, and Mr. Modise literally offered me he shares at discounted prices. They offered mm. me COO position. I was like, I was what, 30, 31? Yeah. I was offered anything just to stay. And mm. I was like, uh, I, I, it's, yeah. So the, these are the moments in your life where you decide, mm. is it the money that you're after or what are you looking for? And um, the hunger for knowledge and, mm. and the wisdom to acquire this um, knowledge that I knew that I can only get in different contexts and mm. in different sectors. Um, I, I, I see your dad there somewhere because remember he didn't really put much uh, weight on material and money and things like that. You know, it's yeah. all about you becoming complete, you know, yes, uh, yes, and acquiring yeah. knowledge and all of that. And even when you do acquire that knowledge, uh, you must be humble. You yeah, must have humility. Uh, and share it. Uh, yeah, well, no, because it's just like a, a yeah. But also your, your knowledge grows by sharing because you also get feedback. Yeah. Uh, I think you become a better teacher. I mean, I enjoy lecturing. I, I enjoy that space of my life and training. Mm -hmm. But you become better because you're also always at school. I always say... Yeah. One of the things that are important about uh, leaders, you must stay at school. And, yeah. and it doesn't mean, I mean, I remember I did corporate law, um, how many years ago? Um, and I didn't even write the exam. It wasn't about the certificate. It was about the knowledge. Um, yes. Or when King 4 was being introduced, I did corporate law at UJ. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't have to write the exam because what I needed, I mean, I also did the integral coaching um, yeah. with UCP. Um, and I literally remember the day in August when uh, the issue I wanted resolved was resolved. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, because I had been having a very difficult coaching client. Yeah. And I just like, I was like really feeling like a failure. <laughs> and I was like, why am I not reaching this person? And why are they not evolving? They'll be fine for six weeks and they're not... Yeah. And, yeah. I, and then um, I went on the course and it's August, remember, light bulb moment. I was like, I was at peace. After that, you just have to finish until November. But it was about resolving this so that I can be a better facilitator of that journey for that person. It's not yeah. so much about accumulating the certificate. Yeah. Now, you struck a very good relationship with the lady who um, I think is the head of the Gibbs Business School, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Prof. Nicola Klein. Yes, yeah, what, what, what is it? Yeah, was it, was it Prof. Nic uh, Nicola? Nicola, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's now in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, RSM, so she's heading up the business school there. 
Yes. Yeah. What was um, it she was my lecturer. You, that made the two of you guys to click to a point where you were almost like doing some work with them, you know, uh, yeah, after you were finished. Yeah. Um, uh, my first introduction to her was she was my marketing lecturer and for my PMD. Yes. Does she teach us for MBA as well? Hmm, I'm not quite sure. But I mean, you know, that's why I say, you know, these skill sets or this knowledge, uh, whether it's psychology, marketing, they're always part of me. So they're integrated in my strategic mind. And yeah. I just loved her approach. I loved her approach. And I found that even after that, if ever, that's why I said life never, there's never vacuum. If I needed to bounce off things, whether it was health issues, my thought issues, I will call her in the morning. We will meet somewhere before she went to campus and I will sh share. She became like a mentor. Mm. Um, but also when I did my thesis, unfortunately, my supervisor was not ready. And I can't name his name because, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was just absent, absent without leave. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so Greg Fisher, who was another amazing lecturer that I, I really enjoyed at Gives, and Nicola, they helped me through my thought processes around um, just putting together my thesis. My issue sometimes is that I can do research and I, I, I interviewed about 30 CEOs and chairpersons, amazing. But, um, and I will think about it, but to sit down and do it, I'd like did it in the last two weeks, mm. um, which was also part of the penalty from my supervisor because he wanted to write a, a journal paper with me. So he yeah. was very unhappy. But uh, yeah, so she was just an open giving human being. I love, I love people that uh, are, are like share stuff and yeah. give you a different perspective. Um, yeah. So I enjoy the fact that I still work with Gibbs, my alma mater. So uh, the board leadership program, yeah. and um, in the past, I used to also be involved with the women in leaders. Uh, Shireen Shepard used to be um, heading that. She is now with Richfield uh, MBA, and she's yeah. doing amazing work there as well. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm very much uh, attracted to people that love sharing knowledge, love giving yes. knowledge, and, and love learning. They never stop learning. Right. Now, we're just going to take a, a short pause um, because when we come back, now we're just going to focus on Pusara, uh, the work that Pusara is doing uh, in terms of helping you know, uh, leadership, trying to develop uh, a certain quality of leadership out there, helping businesses with strategies, turning around companies, uh, the issue of governance, which has become a big, big issue. You know, a, a lot of uh, companies, you know, you know what they say, uh, the fish rots from the head. Most times the problem is there at a board level and then you know, we find that the whole company is actually rotten. So we're going to talk about those things um, as we go towards wrapping up. Uh, but let's just hear from uh, the people who are listening, uh, what comments uh, they have shared uh, already. Good afternoon, Doc, and this is Dudu. Um, the first comment we have is written by Financial Sense TV. They're saying, um, hi, Dr. Fundi, and greetings, Ms. Msomi. It's good to be here. The second one um, is written by C. Zomzizi, who wrote, wow, what an introduction. Third is written by Goli Samyanda, um, who wrote, great introduction. I love the Saturday tradition. Another one is from Buyani Zwane, um, who wrote, very good and solid foundation. All human beings are valuable. Another comment is from Ria Porto, who says that, that's an amazing connection to have. Mm -hmm. Again, Buyani Zwane wrote, valued and treasured. Mm -hmm. Now the comment is from Mato Metulari, who's, who's asking, did religion had any influence on your outlook on humanity? And um, comment from Tembi, who's saying, wow, you are a very strong woman. Another comment from Nozu Gomgabai, who says, Juju's love is unmistakable. Same <laughs> as three decades ago. What an inspiration you are, my longtime friend. 
you were so articulate and assertive, even as a teenager when we met at Varsity. Nothing has changed. Truly, girls that are affirmed by their dads are set for life. For life, I love your energy. And a comment from Koli Sanyata again, um, saying, talk about spiritual leadership. Um, Timbi again says, right intentions, so powerful. Coming from Sakele Ndabini, who's saying, um, I first met Dudu on Instagram, then personally met at Eve's Institute. She's a woman of substance and a go-getter. Another comment from um, Diniko, of I was saying, I'm enjoying this interview. Dudu, you are uh, bringing back memories of our city days. Um, <laughs> another comment from Maria Pot again. He says, excellent interview. Mazzini uh, wrote, powerful and informative session. Nozugum Kabai again says, Nesta Dlamini, our friend and angel, is smiling mm. from heaven, no doubt, with a heart emoji there. Mm. Last comment is from Nokutula Shenge, who wrote, we love you, Juju Msomi. That's all we have for now, dog. Thank all you. Right. Thank, thank you very much, Nwabisa. Thank you very much. Uh, do is there, if you want to comment about any of those, uh, you know. Oh, Nozu is going to make me cry. Yo. Yeah. Oh, we miss Nesta. Oh, boy. Yeah. That was a tough loss. Mm. Mm. We were young. Oh, sorry. She was a beautiful human being. Mm. I didn't expect that. Yes. But such a great teacher. I mean, it's um, I I find those human beings in my life. I mean, there's one Utembi Samahele. Yes. I remember we met at some, and I know you're gonna say for a shy person, yes, it was at a party, my friend's party, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And um, so we were chatting and these people around me and we were chatting about whatever. And, uh, and I remember she called me afterwards and she said, uh, you know, I love your spirit. I thought you were a bit snobbish, but <laughs> I, I think I love, I love who you are. Is there anything I can do to help you on your journey? Who does that? Yeah. Huh? I mean, like, you know, so, and I think it's so important that we always lift each other up and give each other feedback. Yes. Um, I mean, I always say it's always a pity that we look at the external, you know, you tell somebody, oh, you're beautiful, but it's kind of like just feedback sometimes how they make you feel and how yes. they're making your journey in this world lighter or more beautiful or something, you know, just sharing those. And I, I have friends and around me that are just so open about that. It's, uh, I think it shows such strength and, and um, because I think the soft issues are really the hard issues. Yes. To, to be able to be vulnerable and to, to, uh, to share some of those things and just be upfront with people, I think is, uh, is amazing. But thank you so much for that feedback. Uh, Umatumi asked about religion. I'm not necessarily religious. I was brought up um, in a Methodist home. My mother is very much um, uh, quite um, uh, dedicated. Uh, I was brought up in a Catholic school. <laughs> I was brought up by German nuns. But I'm not, I'm not necessarily religious. I, I am spiritual. I really believe um, in how we treat each other is more important in how we make each other feel and mm. uh, how you look after each other. So the yes. concept of Ubuntu, honestly, is, is the most evolved way. And I mm. wish us as Africans could really appreciate how mm. evolved that way. We don't see each other so much that way anymore. Yes. Um, yes. I see you. I see you. 
go yeah. moon to go, but you know, but yeah. you really have to appreciate what it means to be a human being. Yeah. And uh, and our vulnerabilities and our strengths all, all in one. Um, yeah. yeah, so for me, it comes from that, just the feeling the interconnectedness with everybody. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your class. Uh, you may not always bond to to be like soulmates with other people, but yeah. we are all interconnected. So yes. for me, when I meet people, it's always about, am I a vehicle for them to learn something? Yeah. Or am I to learn something from them? So that's always the exchange. And during this time of COVID, you know, the issue of interconnectedness, you yeah. know, uh, has just become you know, exposed as one thing that we must really, and, 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 and just also knowing that, you know, um, with all that you have, you know, uh, qualifications, whatever, the world can come to a standstill. Yeah. And all of those things will mean nothing to you. You know, and no money can you save help you out of that. No money can save you. I mean, this is the thing, the whole uh, debate of, you know, it's so painful, the people that we have lost during this and may still, I mean, I never take it for granted. My mom gets very uncomfortable when I speak about it. I mean, I was infected in December and I was like, but it's never guaranteed that you will survive, you know? Yes. Um, so even now I say, I, I, I may not make it, but mm. you're not gonna expose yourself, mm. but it may just happen. Um, and this is why, for me, it's always important to live each day and each second. I don't even go to the day anymore. Each second as though it were the last. And that mm. was one of the most important things that came out of our family. Um, you do not end a day or a conversation with something that you will regret if you never see that person ever again. Mm. Um, and, and I remember before my sister died a week before we had had a, a conversation and she didn't want to do something because if she didn't want to do something, my mama will call me. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and, and so, and so when we spoke, uh, I said, I love you very much, but I can live for you. You yeah. have to make some of these decisions for you. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I can't impose no matter how I want this for you. I can't impose it. And so after our conversation, uh, we put down the phone, she called me back and she said, are we fighting? So I said, no, we are not fighting. She says, because I don't ever want you to play this over in your head and, and regret. Um, and uh, I didn't know she was gonna die, I remember. Uh, mm. But it's also a principle. Um, I remember one time, uh, mom and I had some disagreement and I needed to drive back to Varsity. Um, and so she hid my car keys because she had borrowed me her car yeah. while I was at um, AAA. Um, yeah. because, um, so I couldn't drive because mm. this is, so we said we have to resolve this. Yeah. And, um, and that's the home I was brought up in where you literally, so even now, if mom and I have a disagreement, I have to ensure that that closing is comfortable enough for me to live with if I never speak to her again. Yeah. And that's an important principle because um, to, my vision um, is around not living with any regrets and all fear. So, mm. And, and it's an important principle in terms of being conscious. I know people talk about mindfulness and yeah. I've always believed in living consciously. If you live consciously, you are very intentional about how you think about things and how you do things, even mm. a small thing, uh, which is why I remember when I said, mm. when dad said something which hurt me, Yeah. He, he, you know, so because you're so aware of the people and the impact you have, mm. you, you every second, live every second as though yes. it were your last. Last one, mm. yeah. All right, so um, we are now looking at Busara, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, you know uh, the, the organization that uh, you are a CEO of. Um, but before we get there, you and leadership, eh? you know, I mean, if, if, if somebody asks me, you know, I mean, they don't think about everything else I do. They think about to talk. 
Yet, and to so many other things besides being a doctor. Now, when I think of Dudu, I think leadership, I think strategy, you know, I think people, you know, uh, I think organizations, I think governance, all right? Now, um, tell us just a little bit about what happened when you decided now, Ngikara Ibusar. Yeah. Uh, leadership uh, partners and uh, what did you hope what, what what was your vision and 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 what was the mission of that organization yeah so it started in 2009 uh but remember i said i left such and such in search of something yes i always knew i wanted to be paid for how i use my mind and yeah. how i resolve issues and yeah. how i see the world when I did corporate governance in 1996, mm -hmm. I did not see it as compliance. I actually yeah. saw corporate governance as this is how you do things in order to run good organizations. Yeah. This yeah. is what, uh, what it is to run good organizations. So there was something ignited in that. Yeah. Even while I was at Saatchi, I had an option to continue um, mm -hmm. because like Tata Machans was one of our campaigns. Yes. Um, uh, Omangaliso and Rowan actually were the creative directors of that, very proud. Um, so, and, uh, so I worked on, on National Lottery, I worked on Visa, I worked on other accounts, but I had to decide, do I continue on that or what do I do? And I then requested, because in advertising at that time, there weren't too many advertising agencies that had human resource departments, and yet, that's the most important asset, isn't it? Human beings, the talent we have is the most important. So I requested if I could start a human resource discipline, what, was, what did I know about it? I had no knowledge. I remember going to the UCT library and being in that library for like a week or two, mm -hmm. just studying anything I could find in human resources. And then yeah. I went and I presented to the board a, a human resource strategy. This is yeah. how I want to do things. So... Yes. I just looking at such and such because I always saw such as saw me such and such. If this was my organization, how would I run it? How yeah. what could be done better? So I found that my mind was always around how so you were a it. consultant all the time within even, the organization, yeah. even in the organization. So even within um, the advertising discipline, the one thing that was uh, unsatisfactory for me was you could come up with a creative idea that will not have anything with how do you literally add to the bottom line. It will yeah. just be, I mean, I understand that you can decide what your objective is for the advertising, uh, advertisement, but I found that a lot of times it was just creative ideas that had nothing to do. And I wanted to be at the beginning of the process the strategy part yeah. and working with the leaders that yeah. ultimately make all these decisions, whether it's yes. a marketing decision, whether yeah. it's a human resource decision. Um, so after advertising, I went into financial services, which was another interesting perspective in terms of just looking at the economy and the different stakeholders. But the one thing I also appreciated was uh, for me, I always saw ICT as a strategic driver. At yeah. that time, it was very much seen as a support. It's a support okay. uh, function. And, and it's very difficult when you are not seen as a guru in anything yeah. to explain why are you seeing this as a strategic driver and what are you talking about? So, but the one thing I did was um, after my, oh, after my MBA, during my MBA, one of the things that you do when you at Gibbs is do the global elective. So you yeah. choose where you want to go. So because I was going to be interested in professional and consulting services, I went to the US. Yeah. Uh, so you go to New York and Boston and literally visit all. Um, so you're given a, 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 an assignment to talk to the different um, consulting firms and come out with you know, the key learnings from that. And one of my guardian angels um, that I had met, uh, because while I was doing my MBA, um, I also consulted with the Young Presidents Organization, because I also wanted um, 
and and it was really because it was trying to grow on the African continent. So yeah. I wanted to be able to interface within the African continent. But one of the guardian angels that I met there was Gareth Ackerman, who is the yeah. chair of the campaign. So I shared with him what it is that I want to do. So when I went for this global elective, he literally opened up his little black book and mm. gave me contacts from Harvard professors to family owned or oh, family focused consultancies. And so over and above, you know, the usual big four that we went to interview, I also had different business models that I was exposed to with regards to consulting. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, even though I did that, I still thought my focus will be women on boards. So yes. literally my, my um, entrepreneurial focus, Greg Fisher, my lecturer, wherever you are, um, um, they really helped, the entire class actually helped develop this, helped mm. me develop this business model. But because I always understood that women on boards and from my thesis around factors affecting women representation on boards, the critical mm. thing is about diversity. It's not that yeah. the gender itself, it's about yeah. diversity. And I thought having a business that focuses on women on boards is short-lived. And yeah. when you look at recruitment practices for boards, they usually, you go to executive search companies or it's referrals. Yeah. It's very difficult to go around selling candidates. And, and, yeah. and I had that dream because yeah. I think we have amazing female candidates in our country, which yeah. are not really exposed, but you, the, you will not make a living because you will be knocking down doors and nobody will be recruiting. So yeah. my focus uh, kind of then kind of focused on leadership. Yeah. But while I was doing my MBA, I started finding out which consulting firms I would want to get experience in. Yeah. And I did look at the big ones. And one of the big ones wanted me because of my advertising background, yeah. they wanted a partner in that space. And then another one, but you know, one thing I realized is that in consulting, the model is when you're a partner and you're senior, you're a salesperson, you're actually not the one uh, helping the clients. You know? Yes, so you're more of a business development person. <laughs> yes, and I didn't want that. Um, the one thing that I learned from my mother is because she was so focused in making sure that her family has stability and financial security is that she didn't take as many risks with her life yes. with her intelligence and abilities she didn't and i yes. thought that is the one gift that she has given me yeah i don't have a child i don't have a hubby i can experiment with my life and yes. in, if there's anything i don't know what i'm in this world to do i don't i don't go into the purpose versus whatever yes. i find meaning in what i'm doing but I just thought, can I use my life as my own classroom and, yeah. and, and, and develop a way of doing things where I'm the one that is part of facilitating that journey instead yeah. of hiring people and just getting business in and, and having graduates doing the work, yeah. which is some of what the models are. Yeah. Um, so I joined an ICT consulting company, which was called Ascentis, an amazing guy, Ricardo Chiletti. I literally yeah. emailed this, <laughs> I found him on the, because I looked at all the others that I had inter interviewed and, and I said, I, I, it looks like you're doing something interesting. I'll be interested. And he said, okay, come in for a meeting. Yeah. And, uh, we, I, and they were in the ICT space, which yeah. remember I said they were going to be strategic drivers. So yeah. I needed to be comfortable. I may not be a CIO, but when yeah. you're talking technology to me, I mustn't look blank. Yeah. So that was going to be one of the areas that I wanted to be a generalist in, in order yeah. to be a good strategist. Yeah. So in November, the idea was for me to take over the Ascentis as a CEO in the future, because I was MD. And he said, you know what, Dudu, you're really passionate about leadership and strategy to mm. change this organization from what we are doing into what you want. It's going to be like turning around the Titanic. Yeah. 
I will be willing, if you want, to cover your salary for three months yeah. while you build this. So literally, with nothing in the bank, on the January 2009 Busara Leadership Partners. Mm. And really, my thought process was, we have a lot of focus around positional leadership, mm. but the positional leadership doesn't mean that people really have the competence to do what they need to do. Yeah. We also have uh, the transforming environment where a lot of us are fast tracked. Yeah. Where we need the support. You need a soft place to be able to learn these things without judgment. Mm. Um, and so, but so leadership development requires people to be strategic and yes. requires people to have good corporate governance practices. Yes. So it's an integrated approach. This is how a leader becomes effective by integrating those disciplines. And it's how you use your mind. Yes. Strategy is about prioritizing. Huh? Yes. Prioritizing, yes. filtering. How am I going to get from point A to point B? Point B. Yeah? It's more like a blueprint. Yeah, corporate governance is about how you do your behavior yeah. and how you do that. So for me, it's integrated. It is not different. Uh, and I really, even now, I still feel that there is a gap. We do a lot of, which is why my work is bespoke. We mm. do a lot of off-the-shelf stuff. Um, mm. People love the methodology. What methodology are you coming with? It's like, I have no idea. I don't know what your issue is. Yeah. <laughs> we still need to investigate. Uh, I mean, sometimes, um, and, 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 and the one thing I then also found important was the personal leadership space. I, I was about to ask you about that because again, you know, when you are in business school, usually the first module uh, uh, and, and here is, is about being able to manage and lead yourself, yeah, you know, before you can do that for others, you know. We talk so, about it though, hey. We really talk about that, but how much of it do we do? That's it. Hmm. So, part of what I think as Africans uh, we need to do more of yeah. um, is to not only learn theories and models of others, but is also to augment change and come up with our own thinking. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not enough that we will keep on uh, quoting others, quoting this model. And yeah. I understand sometimes in our context, we are so risk averse that you want something that has been proven. Yeah. But those things uh, that you are now spouting had to come from somewhere yeah. And then that environment had to take a risk. So yeah. whether you're talking about the McKinsey seven S's or yeah. the cash cow model, uh, yes. that came from somewhere. There's an environment that allowed that risk to happen for them to experiment. Mm. As Africans, we are not doing enough of that pioneering of developing. So yeah. in working with leadership a lot over the years, I've come up with my own definition. So yeah. my definition is, if I can read it to you, yeah. yeah, it's the ability to direct. That's the vision. Yeah. It is to shape. That's the flexibility and agility to change mm. things. Mm. To influence. Mm -hmm. That's the whole skill of persuasion. Yeah. Communication. Yeah. yeah. Into the future vision. Leaders yeah. is always leading us somewhere. Yeah into a new, that's what a leader is. We have no idea the mm. future is new. Every mm. second is new. You may yeah. think you know what's gonna happen, but it's still new and it's unknown reality. So yes. the ability to direct shape and influence into the future, a new and unknown reality. That for me is what leadership is. It has yeah. nothing to do with position. Yeah. It's got to do with that ability to do that. And sometimes you exercise that in a position 
Yeah. But most importantly, it's important that you do it in relationship to yourself. Mm. That's where the personal leadership. For me, mm. usually people that are good, and, and I'm not talking about impression management because yeah. we can impress people and manipulate people in terms of yeah. how we are seen. Yeah. And you think those cues talk to, like if I say a CEO, you yeah. have an expectation of what that. Mm. So remember I said my MD jeans and t-shirt? Yeah, with, with, yeah. with a hole. <laughs> and yet his mind and the things he achieved. Yeah. Nothing to do with impression management. It was substance. Yeah. Mm. So the leadership space and strategy and all those things are for me are all integ integrated. Yes. Um, uh, so I enjoy that because um, even if I'm working in teams, ultimately, if I'm helping a client with the strategy facilitation, I hope that my how of doing it makes a difference as much as the what that I'm doing. Yes. Now, you know, um, again, you know, a, a number of organizations will have this thing that maybe annually uh, or once every three years, they go out, uh, post perat, whatever. It was a big thing to formulate a strategy, right? Um, but then, so there is this thing about developing a strategy, but then there's also the thing about executing the strategy. Yeah. You know, uh, so some people are very good at getting that strategy, you know, developed, but then find that the execution, you know, flounders. Like it's about what strategy is, mm. isn't it? Strategy mm. is what you do. Yes. The document is not the strategy because exactly. what you develop as a plan is only going to be a strategy if you execute by it. what you do it. Yeah. So if you go for a post and do that, and then you go into the office and do something else, you've just That's changed it. your strategy. That is your yeah. strategy. Mm. So... Uh, it's what you do. This is why sometimes when I work with management teams, I try and help them figure out how they're spending their days and what they are doing. Mm. Is what you said you're going to do what you are focusing on. I mean, yeah. I remember coaching one, <laughs> one GM, was she a GM or uh, whatever of her uh, division? And she was so frustrated because the person that she's to report to, they used to all go out, do the strategy, have what they're going to be focusing on and then he used to go around the world attending conferences yeah. <laughs> and every time he'll come back inspired yeah. <laughs> and then he wants to change this and that you yeah. must know what areas you're able to tweak but yes. but also your thought process and the way you think about things has to be uh broad enough and high level enough so that you are not changing willy-nilly. People yeah. think taking an action is a strategy. That is not a strategy. Yeah. Strategy yeah. needs a whole lot of other things. So um, if you are, I remember one person talking to me about a, a financial services product yeah. and they had white labeled this product mm. and the underwriter was a retail company. The mm. retail company then soon decided they're going to develop their own insurance mm. product. Can you see that strategy was not well thought through? Because no. when they were having that partnership, before you even, you should have thought about the potential yes. of so, this uh, some person form of being your future, future competitor. Of trade, some restraint of trade built in within that, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's more than that. And it's also about the environment. So mm -hmm. a lot of us, I mean, the one thing about MBAA, which we all love, is the models. So you'll do your SWOT analysis, you'll do yeah. your pastel. But in reality, not many of us in the real world focus on the pastel. We yes. just don't. So yes. everybody now calls um, the COVID a black swan. No, yeah. it was not a black swan. Bill Gates knew about it. There was even an, uh, a, a thing. We did not know it's going to be called COVID, but we yeah. knew that potentially there could be viruses like that. Yes, because after, like, after, after the original SARS, you know, mini, you know, pandemic, 
uh, in 2002, 2003, that's when more Bill Gates and other people started saying, what if you can have another virus like this, yeah. but on steroids? And then what about biological working. welfare? There's a yeah. potential for biological warfare. There's a yeah. potential for scarcity. There's a potential that we will not have water and we have to uh, fight amongst each other. Scarcity of resources. We always, when you create, I mean, the one thing that she's always worrying me is the centers of excellence. So, yes. and I so always say, so, and, and just in time, remember just in time yes. can be positive and it's also negative because yes. now you're not able to get those parts. You're not, yes. nothing is flying, nothing is coming anywhere. Yeah. How, what is your backup plan for that strategy? Exactly, exactly. Now, you know, um, you do a lot of facilitation of these, uh, you know, strategy sessions with the uh, senior teams of organizations. And I just want to ask you a question there. Um, some people will will just take that top layer, you know, um, but some others will say, no, I want the top 50 people in my organization because it will help me in terms of communicating, you know, the strategy and stuff. Uh, but others, they feel, no, let's get the elite people at the top. Uh, they don't want to sit with middle people and stuff like that. You, you, when you are talking, obviously you, 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 you get to be engaged by these organizations to facilitate. Do you ever give an input as to, you know, yeah. who, should we, who should we be inviting at what, you know, yeah. what level? There's a difference between communicating strategy and developing strategy. Yeah. So the, the worst, what people want from leaders, positional, because in corporates, we talk about positional. There is a role for positional leadership. As much as we all talk about everybody's a leader in whatever position, the reality yeah. is that in corporates, you still have a hierarchy. Yeah. People are looking for trust and security. I yeah. must trust that you have the ability to take us to the next step, right? Yeah. There's a different role for you. I do not like it when, especially the executive team or whatever mm. team of that organization goes into a strategy session with all their staff when they themselves don't even know, have an idea. Mm. Because you yourselves have to first talk in unison before yeah. you get every, because then it gets very muddy, muddy, yeah. muddy, muddy. And, and, and people start, um, um, uh, some of the, the group dynamics can be very uncomfortable. Yeah. You'll also find that the group dynamics are such that the people in lower ranks actually end up not talking anyway, because yeah. they always filtering what they are thinking about. Yes. So part of what I also like doing is one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And most organizations uh, agree with that. Some of them don't because it takes time. You can't today say to, to come and facilitate a session tomorrow. Mm. That's not strategic facilitation. That's just facilitating a conversation. But yeah. I'm not able to help you to really develop a strategy because there is still some preparation. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. the one-on-ones before coming into a room is key because you then pull out what the issues are, understand mm how different, how aligned, how different they are. And you're gonna at least be on a lookout for those things. So for mm -hmm. me, it's always important. And also I don't like it when the leader, I mean, I've just done one with the financial services firm where, especially when you're a new appointee, you already have a whole presentation of what it is. Cause remember they recruited you and you yeah. said, this is what you want to achieve. So you then want to call a strategy session with your executives and then present what your strategy is. Why then are you having a strategy session? Mm. So at some point you have to hold back. Mm. You can share the principles of, I would like us to get there, you know, but still have the room for people to give input. Because yeah. if people think you are very, married to your direction it's very difficult for them mm. they just know which is why people get irritated with strategy sessions because mm. they know that even though they've given all that input ultimately you're gonna go back and do what you want yeah you see yeah um okay so um ethics and leadership and uh, you know um during these uh, i'm not gonna say the wasted nine years 
uh, you know, that you talk about, but in recent times, both in private sector and also even in the public sector, there's been serious ethical breaches, you know, uh, that come from the top. So the role of ethics, you know, or, or, or the importance of ethical leadership, just a little bit about that. Yeah, this is why we always come to the individual, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and also remember the followers elect the leaders. Mm. So the leaders are a reflection of who we are. Yeah. It's an uncomfortable conversation to have, mm. but also it's about, because we then can debate of, I mean, really when you look at it, how many people are in branches that are mm. actually electing, but the, 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 the thing is that we all elected not to be in those branches in order yeah. to be part of the numbers that, you know, so ultimately we take responsibility. Mm. Um, this is why, I mean, one of my favorite quotes, which I'll read to you now, yeah. is one man cannot do right in one department of life whilst he is occupied in doing wrong in any other department. Mm -hmm. Life is one indivisible whole. I love that one. It's from Gandhi. Yeah. You can't elect people where you know in their own private space, this is what they do. Mm. And then you elect them into positional leadership and you expect them to do something different. Mm. It is the same person. The common denominator is always the individual. Mm. So we get what we elect. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then, somebody, uh, okay, maybe this one, I'm not sure if I should be uh, saying it, but I mean, uh, one of the people that we really look up to in terms of leadership is Umandel, you know, a, you know, a great leader he was, um, but he was not a perfect person. There were Precisely. Yes. life that were actually not functioning. Yes. Mm. But remember, he also evolved. This yes. is the thing about leaders. You have to learn. Wisdom comes not from perfection, but yeah. we learn. Uh, yeah. So how he thought before he went to prison and how he thought when he left were two different things. Yeah. Um, there is nothing wrong with uh, personal wealth. Yeah. It's the context of while I become wealthy, what are the mechanisms that I'm doing to do that? Am I doing it at the expense of others? Yeah. The one principle I really have enjoyed all my life since I came across it, Raymond Ackerman is very much into it, self-enlightened self-interest. Mm. What is good? I must do what is good for you. It's a win-win situation. Mm. So in his business model, when he looked after what he called the queens, which were the housewives, mm. he was ensuring that they always support his businesses, which allowed him to be wealthy. Yeah. You do good. So there is nothing wrong. The question is always, I always ask is, what is the ethics of paying somebody 3,000 while you're getting 60 million? And that's the value you've given. One thing that the pandemic has shown us is the value of frontline staff. Those mm. are the worst paid people. Mm. And yet without them, we wouldn't have survived. Yeah. Those, when you go into a retail shop and those, I mean, I remember speaking because uh, um, I also get invited to do talks. Uh, one of my favorite retailers, I don't know if I should mention the name, that's, um, but I was speaking to their management team about filling up your cup. Yeah. Since March, 2020, many of them have never taken leave. Yeah. Just imagine. And yet we the ones that go shopping, we get pissed off when the shelves are empty. Mm. Um, if, the, if there aren't enough tills working, mm. um, you know, so in terms of ethics, the, it's much more complicated. I always say, start with yourself. Yeah. What do you do in your space? Because it's always easy to point a finger. It's terrible when our public funds mm. are siphoned the way they have in billions, yeah. where we have so many things. 
Yeah. So I'm not undermining that at all. Mm. But it also comes from the little transgressions that we let go, mm. that we turn the blind eye to. I mm. mean, I was shocked that we actually allowed the things to happen for nine years. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. a lot of us become very afraid because also it's punishing to be upfront and outspoken. Mm. Business stops because it's like, okay, that person is high risk. Yeah. You bringing attention. So I could understand all that. But yeah. in terms of ethics, honestly, it starts with all of us. Yeah. And not allowing things to slip. Remember I said uh, leaders, it's about personal integrity yeah. and technical competence. Yes. Look at the leaders that were technically competent but because of the decisions that they took. I mean, when you look at some of well-respected people yeah. who we all respected, but yeah. because of the shortcuts. And the thing is that things that happen in the dark always come out in the light. And that's mm. what corporate governance is. So also in our own spaces, we have to try very hard to do things where we don't get blackmail. Because honestly, there are times where I think Somebody had something over that person. Yeah. You know? So sometimes maybe it is a lesser evil for that whatever thing to come out yeah. than for you to be part of destroying our country. Mm. So ethical, this is why ethics starts with us. Because yeah. if all of us are aware of our behavior, we will not get into situations where mm. we're going to be blackmailed and forced to do something mm. where you now and the people remember the people who are whistleblowers yeah it's tough mm. there it's a very lonely road mm. the, by the time those came to light they had been lost their jobs no income so we all point fingers but we're not there because mm. who do they call mm. who's gonna pick up the the bulls for them Mm. And that is part of the challenge of um, how do you ensure that you are not always vulnerable? Mm. So even our lifestyles, we get yeah. into a situation where our expenses are such that if you do not get the next paycheck, you can't survive. Yeah. But if somebody is going to ask you to turn the other way, what are you going to do? Mm. Mm. It's a complicated stuff. It's, yeah. Academically, it's easy. I can always quote definitions of what ethics is. Yeah. In reality, I mean, I must say one of uh, one thing I do enjoy when I, you know, when I'm teaching corporate governance, um, and it's not always a laughing matter. I remember one guy uh, we were chatting about exactly that, and he kind of said, "I understand what you're saying, but I'm sitting on these boards, and they're giving me income." Mm. I am not going to rock the boat. <laughs> I need to pay my bills. This was a, a non-executive director? Yeah. Uh, independent or non-independent? <laughs> independent. Yeah. Wow. Those definitions don't count, Dr. Fumi. Yeah. <laughs> the reality, and this is it. A lot of us yeah, are must actually, be. A, a lot of us are actually leaving corporate and thinking sitting on boards is the way to do it. Mm. You know how that makes you vulnerable? Mm. Especially if you're gonna be in some of these institutions mm. where tomorrow you read in the news, I mean, that was our time during the nine years. So now I think there's more respect for professionals, but yeah. you will read in the papers that that board has been removed, there's a new board. Yeah. And if you are sitting only on parastatals and you're in that situation, you have to be sick, sucking up to people all the time in order to gain those positions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is why for me, it's always important to always keep up your skill set. Um, mm. Not always going to help us. Um, and we've seen that from the Zondo Commission that mm. sometimes you looked at people being successful and you are feeling inadequate. You're like, what's wrong with me? Now mm. you understand what was right with you. It wasn't mm. wrong with you. It was yeah. right. With you. 
I mean, I've been in those positions where mm. you kind of, um, I remember my first learning was at such and such. Mr. Modi said, I gave my guardian angel. I remember um, the entire uh, agency was briefed on this. The leaders of such and such took a decision because it was rootless even at that time in terms of chasing business. And the decision was, are we willing to take a bribe? Mm to get uh, um, accounts. And uh, literally the leadership communicated to us that we would rather close the agency than to, so, and I remember being invited to this particular meeting and uh, this person across the, the, the table said, we will, we will guarantee you'll get this 20 million red account as such and such if you do this and this and that. Mm. I went back to the agency and they said, no. And I said, this is when you know when people live their ethics or not. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And okay. there were people in the industry who are paying for schools for the kids or whoever buying cars and they were well known. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So it happens. It, it happens. Ethics is, is uh, a, a difficult thing. And it's got nothing to do with religion, really. Yeah. Um, all of us as human beings. But it's also tough. The one thing, um, there's a model that I give to entrepreneurs, uh, which is called target your business, which is to help them uh, mm. think about things that they need to do in order to survive. Because your business survives because of? My business survives. Obviously, I mean, uh, you, 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 you need to have a pipeline of business, you know, uh, uh, you know, revenue. You need paying customers. If you do not have paying customers, because you can have clients on your books, if they're not paying, you mm. do not have business. So it it's to look at that. So, but the one thing, the, the E in the target is ethics. Yeah. Because when you have bills to pay, it is a reality. You have to be aware that when you're going through a recession and going through hard times, what decisions can you potentially make that can mm. compromise you? So it's mm. part of the strategic thinking about yeah. your business. Yeah. Um, I always say to people, do not start your business until you, you have thought about what's the worst thing that can happen. Mm. Losing your car, losing your home. What are you able uh, or willing to do? I mean, I have a, a, a friend, um, my latest Wisdom Personified is mm. Nona Koza, so you must watch it. It came out mm. today. Yeah. And one of the questions is around that. And she says, gosh, I have been broke. Yeah? But it's yes. about money. You can start afresh. Mm. Um, what are you willing to, to, to do? And it's tough. I mean, mm, I would never, ever judge anybody because until you are in those shoes, yes, it's yes. Tough. you try. You can only aspire to, to be ethical, but I, I do understand. But I always say just try and keep your expenses low enough so that when things don't go according to plan, you're able to at least survive a bit and mm. find opportunities and and. Get, gather those guardian angels around you. And this is why we always need to be guardian angels for people. Mm. You just need to be guardian angels for people. All right. So um, we need to wrap up. Um, but before we do so, courageous leadership. Oh, you talk yeah. about courageous leadership. <laughs> yeah. Um, should we um, quote Udada? The fact yeah. that courage is not uh, the absence of fear, mm. but yeah. despite it. I mean, courageous leadership to be able to do the right thing. It's tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, um, it comes from a place of, there are many other things that need to be in place. Um, yeah. So if you in a board position, um, you kind of have to know your stuff, read your work, yeah. uh, know the organization, know your stuff. Um, because if you're going to stand up against something, at least do not have holes poked into your argument or yeah. into your thinking. Yeah. The one thing, um, my first lesson around this, I was at Sachi and Sachi, 
and uh, an agency had done something which the creative team thought was unethical or they had stolen their idea. And I remember William calling us into a room and we're talking about this. And I and they wanted William as the CEO to phone this agency and give it to him, you know. And I just said, I do not advise that because you don't know the whole story. My strategy mind was there. You don't know the whole story. I don't think you should do that. I, uh, and I was the only one in the room. Huh? All these are people like very clear what it is. And he did that. He made that call and I, it didn't. And later on, it turned out that the fault was with us. And imagine how embarrassing that is. Mm. Uh, but um, when everybody in that room is looking daggers at you and you are seen as the traitor, you are not supporting us and you're the only one who's going to stand your ground and say, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Mm. Um, and, and, and you have the reason for saying it and you're hoping it is a legitimate reason and it should be respected. And it happens all the time in boardrooms. In boardrooms, courageous leadership is also about asking that question that you think is stupid. Mm. So you look at all these scandals that we've had and you wonder, did nobody, I mean, some of the structures, I mean, when I look at Steinhoff, whenever I find an organization that has too many structures, <laughs> I get worried because if I don't know, understand, and these are dormant, these are whatever, and these are like, mm, I, I, I get worried. Uh, but courageous leadership in the board context is also around asking that question. Mm. And I mean, uh, I, you mentioned that I'm on the Vodacom Foundation Advisory Board. Mm. Um, and um, we were having um, a meeting at some point and I asked for a presentation around technology and spectrum and what, what. Yeah. And, um, and they, uh, they, yesterday we had a board meeting and somebody yes. came to present about that. Um, and for somebody else, they'll think that's so simple, or, you know, why expose yourself that you don't know, whatever. Yeah. I'm gonna expose myself that I don't know because mm. I want to be able to make better decisions. Mm. Um, and, and they were all very grateful um, that I actually asked uh, mm. for that presentation. Um, mm. So courageous leadership is about staying at school. I did say continue learning every yeah. time you should have seen, if you had seen my toes as they were talking about spectrum, it was yeah. like I was a little girl in a candy shop. I was just so excited, which is what excites me about my friends as well. I mean, yeah. I always say, if you are with people for years and every time they speak to you, you learn something new, mm. you know, it's just exciting. Um, mm. But courageous leadership is also about standing your ground and being willing to live with the consequences, whatever they are. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. So um, when you had an interview with me two years ago, <laughs> you asked me, what is my unique value proposition? Can I ask you the same question? No, no. Um, you know, I, if I think about it, I think my empathetic nature, mm. I think, uh, which is also part of the reason why I also decided not to become a clinical psychologist, because I literally thought I'll be crying together with my clients instead of helping them, <laughs> I'll be yeah. crying together with them. But I think it's the ability to be able to really be empathetic to a human being. Yeah. To almost, even if I have not lived that life, to be able to um, kind of understand what they're feeling and how they're feeling. Mm. And where necessary, help them to resolve if it's a place of pain and if it's a place of joy to enjoy it with them, which is why for me, Busara Leadership Partners had to be a facilitator. Mm. 
I do not say I'm the expert. I'm an expert in facilitating. So if yeah. I don't know, I will connect you with who knows. Yeah. Yeah. If I don't know, so if so if I design a leadership development program, I'm not gonna be the only person talking for four days. Yeah. Because there are amazing minds that I have access to. Mm. But because I understand what the problem is. I will design a way of doing it that will resolve it without me being necessarily be the one, but also being able to connect. Because the one thing Prof Adrian Seville kind of says is he enjoys it when I invite him to be a speaker. Yeah. Because the way I phrase my topics makes him think. Yeah. It's he can't regurgitate mm. what you know, he has to think about it. Um uh, I remember Bonang Mohale, yeah. uh, big brother. Uh, um, I, at one point, I asked him to come and speak at one of our seminars. And uh, I don't know what the topic was, but two weeks before the seminar, he sends this presentation. And I sent it back. And I mm. said, that's not what the brief was. <laughs> you wanted him to go and start it afresh and everyone understood. <laughs> His PA was shocked for one, but the worst thing is he comes to the seminar and he tells the entire seminar that this woman, I sent her a presentation, she comes back to me and says, you know, uh, but that's also because I know that the people around the room, even if I don't know who's going to attend that seminar, the space that they're coming in, that's what's going to reach them. And I think that's what makes our seminars and things that we do, they have the spiritual thing around them. Yeah. Mm, so yeah. I think for me, it's, um, I mean, uh, Nombula just called me like two weeks ago and she said, I'm actually going through my journal and I'm living exactly what in the last seminar, she actually pointed the seminar yeah. and, and mentioned Desiree Makrota who had, uh, yeah. I had presented something yeah. And she said, I'm reading it. It has come through. Mm. And, and, and for me, empathetic way of connecting with people, which is why I think sometimes my coaching sessions happen the way they are. Because sometimes you may not vocalize it, but there is something that when you talk that I can be able to say, okay, that's where the block is. Yeah. Now this is where we're going to... But I think that also comes because as much as you don't believe it, being a shy child, even now, most times if I go to a restaurant, I'll be sitting in a corner and I'm observing. So I love observing. This is the most I've spoken this entire week. Yeah. This conversation. <laughs> and I will be silent until uh, I think I have a meeting on Monday. Oh, no, no, I have students that I'm meeting tomorrow, um, I'm not meeting online yeah. uh, for their research. Uh, I spend a lot of time silent and, and thinking and observing and reading, which makes it difficult for somebody if they are in a relationship with me, which at the moment I don't have one, because they don't get it. They yeah. see the public persona and then they don't understand that my nature is this. Mm. Um, and it can only be that because I spend a lot of time observing and thinking mm. and feeling something that I have not experienced. So even if I may not have gone to school barefoot and hungry, if I meet somebody who has been in that, and some of my mentees have been that, I'm able to reach them without them feeling that I'm judging or I think I'm better than them. Yeah. All right. So um, as we wrap up, I've been saying this, um, there's a poem that you oh. wanted to wrap up with. Um, you know, um, can we... You, you know, you want to say something? No, no, no. I'm actually, yeah, yeah. No, I'm looking for it. Okay. Yeah, look for that poem. Um, but for yes, I got it. I got for, it. 
for people who are male and female, you see now we're in, in September, so um, male and female, anyone who's an aspiring leader, words of wisdom, and then that poem. <laughs> Uh, anyone who is an aspiring leader, I mean, you know what, um, first of all, have an understanding of what you want to achieve with your life in terms of your vision. Your vision for your life is not about a position. For me, the vision is about the way you want to feel when you draw your last breath. I always say, start with the end in mind. So the positions that come about and the work we do to earn our income is just by the by. The most important thing is what vision do you want to, what vision you have for your life. Yeah. When you have established that, along the way, it's also going to put the, put the positions. Um, accumulate, always, always learn. Don't undermine anything. I learn from whether it's television, radio, I will learn from a youth magazine, I will learn from anything. Never undermine and look down at your message sources. Mm. Sometimes we're so busy undermining the messenger that we actually do not appreciate the wisdom that we get. Mm. Everything has an opportunity to teach us. So for me, um, whether it's in music, whether it is just the thought, whatever. Um, and it's always great that we read, read amazing books. Uh, I've, I've, I'm doing English literature um, always helped me very much, you know, things like Things Fall Apart, yeah. David on the Cross, um, but always read and learn. And for me, it's not enough to just read. It's the quality. That is my next challenge when I'm working with leaders. How do you help somebody filter quality information coming in? Because now with Google, you, you know, people yeah. can get anything. How do you make That's sure? Why you have so many Dr. Googles now and, 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 and um, you know, so much of hesitancy towards the vaccination, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got many people who are not able to filter what comes through their WhatsApp and in Google and whatever. And it's difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. It's a, it's something that you have to, if you have kids, start training them in the quality of stuff so that when they see something that's not real, they're able to figure out, okay, I need to investigate this more. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we connect it to things that um, talk to who we are. You know, sometimes when you look at even the books that you identify with, I mean, one of the books I read when I was young, I was Nervous Conditions, hmm. um, which is about, it's a Zimbabwean uh, author. And that's because you kind of identify with the characters. So the people that do not want a vaccination, it's because they're already in that mode of thinking. It's just that they're now finding somebody who affirms what they're thinking. Hmm. Yeah. But also... The one thing that's important, develop a diversity of networks, not to use them, but to be mutually beneficial. Yeah. Networks, for me, I love, I have global friends that I speak to quite often. Smita, I hope you're somewhere uh, watching. Lara, Lola, Lo, Alia, um, Nana, Bridget. Um, I mean, and on the continent and outside. I mean, when something is happening in Afghanistan, I have somebody that I'm painting for. Uh, luckily, Hasina is in the UK now. But develop global networks. Mm. Very important. Diversity is not just about our South African cultures and races. You have to be able to land in Nigeria and feel at home, land mm. in Kenya, land in the US, land in Croatia. Um, mm. And those are going to be great leaders of, of the future because mm. not only do you need to be competent to lead virtually, but you also have to be competent to lead global uh, mm. global teams. Um, and also, if in, even if you're an entrepreneur, you need to be able to get business outside of your own country as well. So uh, not putting your foot in it by saying something that is going to upset another culture. It's mm. also gonna help you to develop networks. Yeah. And then maybe just in closing is, um, I like this uh, quote uh, by Buddha. 
and it says, if you propose to speak, yeah. always ask yourself, is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Yeah. And many of us never ask that, which is why we hurt each other so much, mm. which is why we spread falsehoods. Yeah. This is why sometimes we talk more than we should. Mm. Wow. Okay, let's hear that, um, that poem. So in closing, I love this poem. Come to the edge, he said. We're comfortable back here, they said. Come to the edge, he said. We too busy, they said. Come to the edge, he said. It's too high, they said. Come to the edge, he said. We're afraid, they said. Come to the edge, he said. We'll fall, they said. Come to the edge, he said. And they did. He pushed them and they flew. Can you fly, fly into a beautiful life, whatever that life is for you? Wow. Wow. I think uh, that's, that's a, a challenge for all of us. Huh? Can we fly? You know, that's a, that's a challenge uh, for, for all of us. And it's always uh, scary. It's always scary, yeah. Dr. Fumi. I'm not undermining it, but yeah. believe me, you, you have the ability to soar higher than you have ever thought possible. Yes, yes, yes. And if we can always just tell ourselves that that is within us to be able to unleash, to, unleash, uh, to unleash that. All right, um, we, this is the longest interview I've ever had. <laughs> this is the longest, uh, I think the longest was two hours. Uh, I think now we are going to two hours and uh, 27. But anyway, um, there's just three um, comments that um, came through. I just want us to read those closing comments. Um, and then I'll thank you and thank uh, the, the audience afterwards. All right, Doc. Um, the first one is from Manzini, who wrote, indeed, soft issues always have hard issues. And then Financial Sense TV says, my name is Lawrence, I sit Hole, and I have high regard for Ms. Musomi. Interacting with her is like walking around the library because of her professional creed, her humanity. Thank you for having her. Another one is from Buyani Zwane, um, who says, Dudum Somi introduced human assets circa 1999 or 2000 before human capital management replaced human resources management. Then another one is from Hika, who says, I met Dudu during our varsity days back in the 90s always focused and determined to do the best she had um, the best she um, hasn't changed kept those precious values and principles bravo my friend and um Riyama Porter says I love your mind Ms. Bridum Somi my domit Lori says thank you Dr. Fudi you must kindly consider episodes there's a lot more to learn and assimilate from the erudite Ms. Somi Another one from C. Zomzizi, um, he says, team dynamics are very important at the seaside level. They create some alignments that are difficult to break in the boardroom. Another one from Wolsey, Zaga, is saying, you are such an inspiration. I'm mm -hmm. proud of you. And again, Iris Masekwane says, uh, what are you willing to do? Um, what can you tolerate to make your business a success that is thought provoking? And um, Nozuko Mkabai says, I wish our government could afford to hire you, my friend, for our senior management. This interview has been an eye opener. Governance is critical, even in the public sector. The last one is from Tembi Tokao, who says, Thank you for such an impactful interview. Minsomi, you are such 
a powerhouse. Thank you, Doc. That's all we have. Thank you. Thank you, Navisa. Uh, thank you very much. Do you want to make any comments there to do? Oh my gosh, I'm overflowing. Thank you so much for making the time and, you know, it's Saturday afternoon, giving up your time to share this with us. Really, it was a privilege to be part of this. And, um, and Busi and Nozugo and all my friends from Varsity, thank you for the support. I love you guys. Wow. And Biani, my Biani is, uh, is uh, yeah, he's like, uh, yeah, I love him to bits. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody who came through uh, from yeah. different lives, um, yeah. Tembi and all of them, thank you so much for making the time. Really appreciate it. I must it. thank mom as well. We are assuming that mom has been watching. She has been trying to call me. I've been like trying to put this phone off. <laughs> love me, love you. Uh, yeah, no, she's the love of my life. So um, I will talk to her now. Uh, she's yeah. sitting with my my PA, ooh, a corner. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, yeah, they're at home in Durban. Lovely, lovely. All right, man, uh, Dudu, thank you very much. Um, you know, when you interviewed me again I mean, two years ago, I found that 35 minutes very challenging because well, the questions were, they really required one to think deeply. Um, and, uh, but today, um, you know, I thought, um, I'm gonna give you a long time for you to go. You know, once you, you, you got going and you were just going, you know, and very comfortable. And I learned a lot, you know, from the interview especially on matters of leadership, but I've also gotten to know you better as a person, you know, uh, which is why I love that first part of the interview, getting to know the person, because then by the time you get to the things that they are known about, then you know where those things come from, where the influences are coming from. And you can see that this is authentic stuff. This is not stuff that is done for PR. You know, so thank you very much, uh, man, for opening up. Not many people are comfortable with opening up about, especially if they are, you know, their default is out of being shy or introverts. But you know what? You were able to open up. Uh, you were able to share so much about yourself. Um, and uh, it was good also that, you know, people that know you from the 90s or even before, we were on the, you know, we we're, we're watching because then, you know, we we can hear from them, and we can also look at what you've been sharing, and you know, as we always say, you must be the same person wherever you are, at work, at home, or wherever, and the feedback that you've been getting is exactly the same. You know, you are the same person, and that's what we should all be to be consistent in the various, you know, areas of our lives. So thank you very much, uh, Dudu. And um, you. Uh, you can now go and sit and not talk to anybody until those students tomorrow. I've taken all the, um, you know, my words, the, the my words word. for the day. <laughs> you know, uh, now you can go and sit quietly there. But thank you very much. I'll be sending you the YouTube clip. Uh, so Thank that you. those who would like to listen to this, then they can be able, you know, to, you know, you can just send it to them. But thank you very Thank much. You. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll still continue to talk. I mean, we are Facebook friends for that matter. <laughs> uh, Thank you so also. much. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank to you everybody. everybody. Until next time. Thanks. Bye. So, bye.